you can extend this idea to graph attention networks. These are the type of data that you're gonna see, Cora, Sites here, PubMed. You can have graphs, which could be 3D meshes, social networks, telecommunication networks, biological networks, brain connectomes, et cetera. And then you can do graph attentional layers. You have some vector representations for your nodes. They are gonna be F dimensional. You have N nodes. You have F as the size of your features. And then you want to go to the next layer and give you some other features in another dimension. You can do that by some weight matrices, and then you can do self-attention. And self-attention, these types of concepts we saw before in, the, in terms of text. So it's just a quick recap of the same framework applied to graph type of data. First, you need to know what is the score between one node and the other node. And it's gonna give you your attention coefficient. This is a number from negative infinity to positive infinity. You can do mask attention so that you are not paying attention beyond your neighbors. Maybe you want to pay attention to yourself and your immediate neighbors, or you want to pay attention to yourself and two steps away from yourself. So, it, and the rest of them you can mask. So you don't, you don't pay attention to them. And then you need to turn these numbers into actual numbers that add up to one because you have a budget of one for your attention. How much node I is paying attention to node J for your scores, you can take the representation of X, Y, concatenate them. So basically you're concatenating these two vectors, multiply that by a matrix, by a vector, that's gonna give you a single number. And then uh, that's your score. Once you have your score, you push it through your softmax, they're gonna add up to one. And then you spread that budget of one of attention among your neighbors. And then you push it through your nonlinearity. Visually speaking, this is what happens. You take HI, it's node I, node J, you multiply by the same matrix, you come up with A, how much you need to pay attention. This is the leaky ReLU that you see up here. You push it through your softmax and that's gonna give you your attentions. You can have multi-head attention, like what you have for your text, which is very simple. You just concatenate multiple of these representations together. And that's gonna increase the size of your feature. And then for the final layer, you don't want the feature size to increase. You want to keep it the same. So rather than concatenating for the final layer, you just do averaging. And then perhaps you want to get a probability out. Visually speaking, this is what happens. H1 is paying attention to itself through multiple heads. This is one head, this is another head, this is another head. It's paying attention to H2, H3, H4, H5, H6. And then it's going to the next stage to give you the representation for H1 prime. And then uh, graph attention networks, you can use them for both transductive and inductive. And then you can use it for representations and visualizations of your graph. I think I'm gonna stop here and let you guys ask questions. I had a couple of questions on the previous, the one with the induction paper. I think it was the previous one. Yes, so how about this? We go backward. We go sure. from get graph attention to the previous paper and then the previous ones. Any questions from this slide? Okay, perfect. So what's the question about this? I'm a bit confused about what makes it um, good for dynamic graphs in comparison to the previous papers. Because if the graph is changing, once you have to rerun the algorithm to get the um, correct embedding because the nodes change, the neighbors, so that's actually a very good question. Inductive versus transductive. You learn your, your parameters. So at some point in time, somebody gave you a graph and you use that graph to learn your parameters. You learn these Ws. But once you learn it, you learned it. You learned it forever. Now let's say a new user gets added to your graph. You don't have to retrain. All you need to do is take that guy and see Take a look at its neighbors. So this new node is going to have an effect on its neighbors, and you use that to update their representations. And then as soon as the representation of one of these nodes change, you look at its neighbors, and you update the representation of those guys. So it's just one pass that you go through your data and update the representation of each one of your nodes. So you don't do retraining. That's the whole point. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, actually. Yeah. I had another one on this paper, unless somebody else wants to ask a question. 
Okay, I guess you can go ahead. Cool. So I'm a bit confused about the um, the features part. So say one node can have multiple features, whether we're talking about like people's height or number of fans or something like that. So is the embedding vector already correspond to those features or how does it work exactly with the features? Yes, so if you have features to start with, if you have input features, you can build upon them. If you start with something that is just one hot vectors, you are not making any assumptions about the nodes. They are just different IDs, different people. You don't know what features they might have, but sometimes you might have features. Like in the case of the age, you might know the age category of your users. This guy is young, that guy is old, etc. You could perhaps know their sex. You could perhaps know their web browser, what they're using. You could have different sorts of information. So you can put that in a vector. And that could be your initial point for the rest of your convolution. So you don't have to start with one hot vectors. You can start with more information. You can also start with a degree of that node. That could be one other feature. Does that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. So it looks like the embedding um, method that we're doing here is more, it has more information than what we did before with the um, degree matrix. Yes, it is more flexible. It means that you can start from nothing or you can start from some information, some features to begin with. Yeah, makes sense. But if you don't have any information, the first layer is going to be your embedding anyways. So as soon as you multiply a one hot vector by a matrix, you're picking up one of its rows or one of its columns. And that could be your node representation. So this is a deeper version of what we were doing with the random block type of node representations. Okay. Yeah. Because of a nonlinearity and multiple layers. Any other questions?